To all of you out there in College of Complexes Lab, I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everybody here to the College of Complexes tonight and that we, and to our web audience, we meet every week here at Dabbers East Restaurant on Edison in Chicago. My name's Tim, I'll be doing the videography tonight. Andy Anderson will be moderating. <laughs> the College of Co Complexes format consists of the following. Would you quit screwing around with the volume, Charlie? No. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take care of that later, all right? <laughs> Always somebody screwing around with the system. <laughs> I'll get the echo taken care of. Well, we should have done it. She was there to test it before we started. Right? And you didn't. I didn't see it come back here. Charlie, you always got to ruin a perfectly good intro. All right, we're going to do a do-over. It, it sounds like you're up. Bye. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Ted, and I'd like to welcome everybody again to the uh, College of Complexes. We meet at Edison Street at Dabbers East in Chicago every week at 6 o'clock. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period, then we have a speaker who speaks. The next thing we do is we have an infamous question and answer period. After the question and answer period, we have our infamous rebuttal period where we sit down and, or you guys get a chance to speak your mind for the next few minutes. All right. Introduce our speaker, Charlie. What? Introduce our speaker. Oh, just since you're up there, go ahead and introduce Don. Okay, I'd like to introduce our sometimes chair, and for many, many years, a uh, regular attendee, participant at the College of Complexes. Uh, he's spoken a few times here on programs of the political science nature. I recommend they're posted on the, uh, he spoke on the neocons uh, that I can recollect was one of the better programs I've heard at the College of Complexes. Nevertheless, it's my pleasure to welcome again um, my friend and our college regular, Dan Ritchie's going to tell us about how old is Quilly and about how the election was stolen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, too bad. Better luck next time. All right, thank you, Charlie. Uh, now, first of all, uh, first of all, I gotta, I, I have to be, you know, admit that I, that that I couldn't have done this presentation without uh, without the help of uh, other people, and Charlie is one of them. Charlie sent me articles uh, on this topic, and he was a big help. I'd also like to thank two people who are not here tonight uh, who also helped me, uh, uh, Judy Craddaville and Doug Dinkley, who also uh, who did the same thing. They, they did research for me and sent me articles. Um, this is kind of a, compared to some of the presentations I've done in the past. Are you okay, Sid? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, compared to some of the presentations I've done in the past, this is going to be kind of a kind of a cursory uh, seat of the pants presentation because I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare. I'm currently working um, I'm currently working about 50 hours a week. I work seven days a week. I got a day off from work so I could prepare for this today. And um, but uh, so I've been so I've been uh, so it's it's you know so I'm gonna have to apologize for the cursory nature of this presentation. Um, so, you know, if it seems a little bit rough, just uh, please bear with me. Now, um, all right. Anyway, the, as you already know from reading the program, the topic tonight is, was the 2016 election stolen? And what I like is, is the way that Charlie wrote that in the passive voice, which kind of, you know, okay. And, um, that Charlie kind of wrote, wrote that in the passive voice, which suggests, you know, who, okay, well, who did the stealing, you know? Um, and, okay, anyway, anyway, what I'd like to, so, now, and, and so y'all are wondering, is, 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 am I gonna come up with the, well, let me just, first of all, lately, everybody's been talking in the news, that all a big topic in the news is that the Russians stole the election last year. The Russians did it. 
and um, and uh, now I am I am not going to talk about that tonight. And the reason I am not going and and then there's this talk about hacking. We just had a bunch of people that just during the introduction almost gave half my present. You know. Uh, we're talking about about hacking, I'm, and I'm not going to talk about that much either. And the reason I'm not going to talk about that is I consider the allegations. I, I believe it's possible that 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 uh, that Russian hackers could have influenced the outcome of the election, but I do not consider that to be proven yet. Uh, same goes with the other allegations of hacking. Uh, again, I do not discount the possibility of it. All I'm only saying it is not. I'm only saying in the. Um, in this, in this, I would only use the Scottish courtroom sense, not proven. So, instead, I want to just talk about things that actually are proven. Uh, you know, I was doing research on this topic, and and I realized that I had written a presentation on that. I, I had done a presentation here at the college on this same topic nine years ago, uh, during the 2008 presidential election the same topic I, I had already written up an outline and stuff and then I and I went and I went and looked at some of my old some of my old papers and I said oh my gosh I've already done this and it's the same outline it's the same thing because because this was going on what I'm going to talk about is is not the allegations of hacking I'm going to talk about the phenomenon of vote suppression when I meant by vote suppression I do not mean some mysterious thing that's going on with hackers behind the scenes there's this mysterious unknown forces uh, that may or may not be true. I'm talking about stuff that absolutely is true, is proven, it's not controvertible. And and I was talking about these things nine years ago. And here I am, nine years later, nine years later, and here I am talking about the same things. Because since I talked about it then, nothing's been done. Nothing has, nothing, not only, not only has nothing improved, but it's actually gotten worse than it was in 2008. Um, now, so, so what, so what I'm going to talk about here is first of all, what I'm going to argue is that there are people who do not wish to leave the election to chance. Uh, they want to change the outcome of the election by means other than persuading people to vote for their side. Uh, they want to guarantee victory by suppressing the votes of their political opponents using Use it by any means necessary, you know, legal or illegal. It, it, legal if they can, illegal if they have to, and they can get away with it. Um, so in short, what they want to do is rig the election. Now, who am I talking about here? Now, first of all, now some of you have, may have heard, some of you may have heard about, um, about the, uh, Allegations, and I had an argument with with a person who attends regularly about this. About there's there's allegations that that uh, that that Hillary Clinton stole the Democratic nomination. If any of you yeah. hands up, anybody who's yeah. heard that allegation, okay, I see some yeah. hands going up. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. I I looked into that, and most of what I found out is that um, most of the stuff happened was 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 pretty bush league. Uh, the, the strongest allegation of illegal activity is some people who, who found that their registration, their voter registration records, their electronically saved voter registration records had somehow been altered, uh, like, like changing their registration from Democrat to Republican so that they couldn't vote in the Democratic primary. And now that could only have been done by a hacker. And we don't know who did that yet, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that here, but, but what I am going to talk about is, is there is a specific organization that's quite, that, that does stuff that, um, that is actually quite above ground. It's not, it, it's not hacking. And that organ, and, and that organization is called the Republican Party. Yeah. And so, now some people, some people may be offended by me saying that, especially if, if they're, you know, and accuse me of having a liberal bias. You know, and and I, you know, and I do obviously. I was I actually was involved in the election, so I wasn't exactly neutral. But it, it doesn't matter what my opinions are, because the facts are the facts. Now, if you if you can, if, if I say it's raining, and you say you have a liberal bias, well, that, that doesn't get you anywhere. Because the question is, is it raining or isn't it? 
Easy and rare. So, so first of all, what I'd like to talk about, so I'd like to, so what I'm going to talk about is the phenomenon of vote suppression. Very conscious, and by the way, and by the way, largely legal uh, uh, way to to suppress the vote and then guarantee that your own side wins. And, and, and some of this has been done in the past by Democrats. Most of, it, uh, most of it has been initiated and carried out by the Republican Party. And, and now they, the, methods, the methods of doing this are, first of all, felony convictions, voter ID laws, yeah. um, cross-check and various other exclusion programs, limiting access to voting machines, and then the whole phenomenon of how they go about counting the votes, which is something I have some first-hand experience in. So, first of all, um, well, I'm, I'm going to get into the background of this and why suppressing the vote is so important to Republican victory. You know, now most people in this country like to think that the United States is a democracy. That we got, you know, we got free elections. The elections, the people's choice. The people elect the government. And so it's the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. You know, people would say, let the, you know, let the election be held, let the person who gets the most votes win. I mean, that's what democracy is supposed to be about. But I would argue that the current leaders of the, that the leaders of the current Republican Party do not accept this. By the way, I just want to say for now that this has nothing to do with Trump. It's got nothing to do with him, and he wasn't even involved no. in it. it. It would have been the same if Ted Cruz or John Kasich or any other Republican presidential candidate ran, it doesn't matter who the individuals are. So, so in any case, the as I was saying, the, the current leaders of the Republican Party naturally they want to win, but they're concerned that they might not be able to win a fair election. They, you know, I mean, maybe they could win a fair election, but not, not sure. So they don't want to leave the outcome to chance. They want to. They want to make sure. They, they want a guaranteed result. Okay. So now, Republican Party activists have known for a long time that enlarging the franchise hurts their chances of getting elected. Well, restricting voting improves their chances. And um, I'd like to share with you a quote from a conservative activist named Paul Weirich uh, from a speech he gave back in 1980. He said, "I don't want everybody to vote." Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Yeah. So, uh, so let's say you want to reduce the number of votes, particularly the number of votes for your opponent. Um, again, I mentioned that the, the methods that they're currently using um, are, are, first of all, uh, felony conviction laws, voter ID laws. Uh, cross-check and various other exclusion programs, limiting access to the voting machines, and then finally the, um, or, uh, and also I forgot to mention, um, uh, you know, uh, disqualifying voters at the polls is another method, and finally changing the vote count itself. So I'm going to talk about all of those things. Now, on the subject of felony convictions, um, there are many states where if you are convicted of a felony, you lose your right to vote in one way or another. And, and this is a way of, this is, this is really a way of greatly reducing the, um, well, what it does, what it does is say you have a political agenda, it creates an incentive to get as many Democrats convicted of crimes as possible so they lose their right to vote. Now, now, and most of this, and now most, now one of the, one of the things, and who who is most likely to get convicted? Poor people because they can't afford a good lawyer, and <laughs> and and also minorities because they're so much easier to profile. And, and so that's who the police go after. Ooh, that's right. and, and it just so happens, it just so happens that those people vote largely Democrat. Now there's a myth going around, it's been going around since the Nixon years, that, 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 that poor people, or they like to say working class people, uh, vote Democrat. It's a total myth, it's never been true and it's not true now. Or that working class people, excuse me, the other way around, that working class people mostly vote Republicans, it's not true. 
if you look at, anybody know what the average income of a Trump voter was? Person that voted for Trump in the, in the election last year. Any, no, nobody? $70,000. I mean, they might have been a little more, but it's about 70000 Now, anybody know what the average income of a Hillary Clinton voter was last year? $50,000. Actually, it's about sixty. Yeah. Now, it's less, that's not a big difference, but it's less because she had a higher percentage of poor people vote for her. Now, anybody want to guess what the average income of a Bernie Sanders primary voter was? $27. No, no, it was about, about 50000 And somebody asked Bernie Sanders, 50000 did you have more poor people voting for you? And he said, no, poor people don't vote. <laughs> and it's true, because a lot of these vote suppression tactics uh, actually take away poor people's right to vote. Uh, the, in fact, there, there's four groups that the tactics I'm talking about that take away the right to vote. And those four groups are poor people, uh, minorities, um, elderly people, and, um, and college students. And, oh my gosh, now how do those, do those people vote? Uh, well, it just so happens most of them vote Democrats. So, anyway, it's, so, but now, so I've already talked about the felony convictions. Now I want to talk about the voter ID laws. A lot of people say, well, you got to have an ID. You, you, you got to have an ID to get a job, so why shouldn't you have an ID to vote? Well, they didn't for the, for the first, for the first um, several centuries, you know. I mean, for the first 200 years of American history, you didn't have to have a photo ID to vote. Now all of a sudden they're saying, you have to have a photo ID. When you require a photo ID then, see that's actually a kind of backdoor poll tax because then you have to go out and buy an ID in order to vote. And, and the interesting thing is that they've been making, they've been, make, they've been passing even stricter laws. They find, well the law doesn't, doesn't disqualify enough people so we've got to make one that's stricter. Now I'll just give you an example here. This is an example from, from Wisconsin. Let me get this here, okay. Last year, Wisconsin passed the strictest voter ID law in its history. Uh, and um, that law, that law effectively disenfranchised 200,000 people. Now, do you know what the margin was between, uh, do, you, do you know what the margin was between Trump and Hillary? 200,000? No, it wasn't. It was about 22,000. It wasn't much. It was one tenth, it was about one tenth the number of people that were disenfranchised in Wisconsin in, uh, in 2016 by that law. And there were people, I mean, there were elderly guys that were World War II veterans that found that they, they lost their right to vote because, because they didn't have a driver's license. They didn't drive anymore. Well, you don't know driver's license, no vote. Get out of town. Yeah. And, and so, there were, um, now, I'll just give you, um, I'll just give you another example of this, and that is, um, if I go back, now if I go into, um, if I go into some of the, um, some of the background here, um, the felony conviction thing. Now, there's there's two levels to this. Now, are any of you any of you ever remember who Catherine Harris was? Yeah. No. no? Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. A couple of hands go up. Attorney General. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, I actually was alive when she was still Secretary of State of Florida. I'm, you know, I actually my memory. I actually was. Uh, uh, she was the Secretary of State of Florida. I actually need to explain something about the elections in this country. I mean, we don't have one election the way that the media makes it sound. What we have is 50 elections, 50 elections, and, 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 and every state is responsible for the election in its own state. So, so you really have to look at the state governments and who controls them. And who controls the state government really determines who's going to win the election. And now, Currently, about 35 of our states are, are, are controlled completely by the Republican Party. Um, uh, not Illinois. We have a divided government here. But, but, in, the case, but in the case of, a, let's say, a state like Indiana, where you have both, 
both a Republican governor and both houses in the state legislature are also Republican controlled. You have an all Republican government. And, 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 and here's the other thing. The person in charge of elections in most states is, is the Secretary of State for that state. He's not a neutral person. He's an elected person and he's partisan too, he both, or, or she. Uh, belongs to a political party. In this case, for example, Catherine Harris in Florida was a Republican. Um, you know, and if you recall, now the most significant, you, you hear all this, you, you may remember when the big controversy over when, when, uh, when George W. Bush became president, all this stuff about hanging chads and butterfly ballots. In my opinion, that was a big distraction from the real issue uh, in Florida, which is an early example of what I'm talking about. That. The, the, the vote suppression that occurred before the election had even been held was the really key thing. You know, Florida had a law, I've already mentioned the, the law that convicted felons couldn't vote. Uh, that uh, Florida had that law. And, and what the Republic, what, after the Republicans took over the state of Florida, Catherine, uh, Catherine Harris uh, hired a private company to cross check the statewide list of registered voters against felon records and remove from the list, anyone who might be a felon. Not just who definitely was a felon, but they actually erred on the side of going as broadly as possible. We don't know, this registered voter over here, we don't know that he or she is a convicted felon, but he might be, so let's take him off the list of registered voters. And, and so two times the company returned its purge list to Katherine Harris, and both times Katherine Harris insisted that they eliminate more names. Uh, that resulted in large numbers of people being eliminated from the rolls who had no felony conviction at all and who were illegitimately robbed of their right to vote. And now, so that's just one example of, of how the, the felony conviction leads to this sort of thing. And I already mentioned the voter ID laws, and I, and now, I already, there's, now, Something else I wanted to talk about, and it was actually one of the flyers that y'all got that was hand, um, and that is this this whole phenomenon of reducing voter registration. Now, how many of you have heard of the of HAVA, the Help America Vote Act? Okay, one hand. Okay, Andy sort of. Oh, and Charlie. All right. Then I'll explain that. Now, in my opinion, this should actually be called the Stop America for Voting Act. Um, because I think that is its real purpose. That was passed when George W. Bush was president, and it was passed by Congress in 2002, and it was in response to the problems in Florida in 2000. And what it actually does is it, take, it, it took the policies of Florida and it made the federal law. Every state is required to maintain a statewide database of registered voters, like Florida did. And those databases had to be cross-referenced with DMV records, with criminal records and with social security records. Now, if the system detects any discrepancies in the records, the voter is to be purged from the list of registered voters. And this could be over something as minor as a missing middle initial, a change of address, a woman changing her last name to that of her husband, a case of mistaken identity, etc. Now, the law was passed in 2002, but it wasn't implemented nationwide immediately. It took, because it took several years for the states to set up these computer systems. Uh, of course, it, it is in effect now. So, now if you are purged from the rolls as a result of HAVA, some states may be nice and let you know, most do not. Uh, you find out when you go to vote. And which brings me to something else I want to talk about, and that is the phenomenon of the provisional ballot, which is which is something that was mandated by the HAVA Act. Now, the provisional ballot is a bullshit ballot. Okay, those in the vast majority of states, those ballots are not counted. They only count the real ballots. You're either registered or you're not. There isn't any of this screwing around. They ain't gonna go check and see if every provisional ballot per signer is 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 actually registered. No, they don't have time. They did count the votes of the of the regular ballot. In California, they did do it. But in most states, they don't, they don't bother with the provisional ballots. So if you were, basically the provisional ballot was invented because of one of the things that happened in Florida when people were denied the right to vote is they would get angry and you could potentially have a riot. You know, people were, when people are denied their right to vote, they're like, you know, they're ready to fight. But then you give them a provisional ballot, it's basically a kind of pacifier. It says, 
it says, oh, 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 just, just fill out this provisional ballot and we'll, we'll verify that you have the right to vote later. But they don't. So if you get a provisional ballot, forget it. You're not really voting. So, so basically that's what it does. It just creates the illusion that you voted but again, they're not. Um, they're, and, and this isn't even just in. Uh, this isn't even just in, in. And this is a nationwide thing. This is true here in Illinois as well. It's even true. It's true in every state in the country because it's a federal law about the provisional ballots. What percent? Oh, excuse me, it, Ellen. Could you, if, if, if you if you don't mind, uh, just you can say so hold your question until uh, until the Q and A session, please. Uh, now. Um, about 30%. Okay, so so now what's happened? Now, now I'm going to get into now the voter ID laws. Uh, the the official purpose of those voter ID laws is to prevent voter fraud. You know, which is kind of a voter fraud is kind of a boogeyman that's 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 brought up by uh, uh, by Republican politicians. And they argue, well, they, and basically their argument is, we got all these people voting who don't really have the right to vote. They shouldn't be voting, and uh, and and we need to stop. We need to we need to stop uh, those people from voting, so that only the people who really have the right to vote are the ones voting. That's the argument, which basically is a rehash of Paul Weyrich's argument. You know that that when the voter when the when the percentage of voters goes down, <laughs> we Republicans have a better chance of winning. And anyway, the yeah the official reason. Now, but that way of thinking, see, that way of thinking. Now think about what that what go what's behind that way of thinking. It's the idea that not everybody should have the right to vote. That voting is a privilege that should be restricted. The government's going to decide who gets the right to vote. You know. Now, yeah. Now, and I want to talk about. Something else. Now, how many of you, how many of you have ever heard of the software program called CrossCheck or the company CrossCheck? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, more hands go up. Good. That's been in the news lately, although not in the mainstream media. It's it's been in the alternative media. People like Greg Pallast have have reported on it. Uh, CrossCheck is a company and a software program, and it's and it's being used in in, in conjunction with the, with the Hava law. Uh, there, it's actually it's, it's a Crosscheck is a private company. They, they sell their software to state governments to coordinate their voter records. Now, states that subscribe to Crosscheck are states that subscribe to Crosscheck. Uh, basically, their their voter registration records their rec are are cross-checked, cross-referenced with the other states, and. And so what they and by the way, Illinois is one of the states that uses crosscheck. Now, Greg Palace did some research and he found that we are what they would do. They would check. They're not really in, in the business of checking for convicted felons like like back in the Catherine Harris days. They're, what they do is they check to see if there if there are two people with the same name in two different states. And if they find two people with the same name in two different states, let's say there's a Phil Jackson in Illinois and there's a Phil Jackson in Kansas, they would say, ah, two Phil Jacksons. Okay, they're both disqualified. Um, now, the way this works, here's the crazy thing about it. They were actually disqualifying people whose names actually did not match. So, for example, let's take the example of Phil Jackson. Let's suppose that you get a Philip. Um, let's say you have a, a Philip James Jackson in in Illinois, and you have a Philip Antonio Jackson in Kansas, and they'd say, ah, same name. They're just they're just lying about their middle name. Disqualify them. Now, six million people. Actually, no. It's it's six million people have 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 been uh, stricken off. Actually, not just not just now, but actually, it was back in 2014 when they implemented this. That six million people were stricken from the voter registration uh, records all across the United States. Those people would get a big surprise. In the nice states, they would get a, a, a letter in the mail uh, telling them uh, uh, telling them there was a question about their voter registration. In most states, they don't get anything, and, and you just find out when you go in to vote. And 
And if you're a person that works full time and you're not yet retired, it's a it, you know, it, it's a it's a it's a lot of work, you know, trying to get that straightened out. And and what they but but they're claiming it was actually three million. They find two names, so it's three million people who are voting twice. Was what they was what they're saying. It's actually six million people. So six million people stricken from the from the. Uh, from the red list of registered voters, uh, because thanks to crosscheck, um, there is a um, there is a there is something of a racial bias in, in how they strike people off the records. They do not they do not strike off the records people with names like Craddaville or Sobieski or Paydock. They tend to strike off the records people with names like Smith, Jackson, uh, Lee, which is a common name in, in a common Chinese name. And uh, and Rodriguez, names like that, which uh, so now now there's another interesting. How many of you have heard of Chris Kobach? Anybody anybody ever heard of Chris Kobach? Okay, Tom. No, no, nobody. Oh my God, nobody's ever. Okay, got two hands up. All right. I heard the name, but I don't know. Okay, Chris Kobach. He's been in the news lately. Chris Kobach is former Secretary of State of Kansas. And when he was the Secretary of State for the great state of Kansas, uh, he wanted to make Kansas become, for, for, for vote restriction, what, uh, what, what Arizona was for stopping illegal immigration. And Tom, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, he wanted to be the Sheriff, he wanted to be the sheriff Joe of, of voter fraud. And so he, uh, now, now Chris Kobach is actually um, is is actually the uh, in, in, he moonlighted besides being the Secretary of State for Kansas, he also moonlighted uh, as a um, uh, as the uh, lawyer for a uh, for a racist anti-immigrant organization. And um, but in any case, he put it, what he did. Here's what he did: when he purged when when he was Secretary of State, he purged the Kansas voter rolls in 2015. Anyone they sent out a, they sent out a letter. This is this is really extreme. They sent out a letter to everybody. Anybody who couldn't, anybody who didn't respond to the letter, providing proof of their own citizenship within 90 days, lost the right to vote. Okay. And um, now I mention this because because um, just last month uh, Donald Trump accepted or he appointed Chris Kobach vice chair of a new presidential commission on election integrity. Okay? What uh, Chris Kobach and the other members of this of this or, of of this new presidential commission are going to do is they are going to investigate voter fraud here in the United States. There are way too many people voting. If only so many people hadn't if only so many people hadn't voted illegitimately, Trump would have won the popular vote. He wouldn't have he wouldn't have lost by several million votes to Hillary Clinton. Or that's what they're saying. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence. They had um, no in the yeah. So uh, now another, which brings me to another person who is a member of this um, of this group, and that is a, another person who has, um, and that is a man named Kenneth Blackwell. Anybody ever heard of Kenneth Blackwell? Yeah, maybe. Okay, Karina. Yeah. Uh, Ellen? Okay. Uh, Andy? Okay, we got a few people. All right, I want to talk about I want to talk about Ken Blackwell. He was the Secretary of State for Ohio. And um, now Ohio in 2004 had an all-Republican government and the Republican Secretary of State, Kenneth Blackwell, was also the chairman of the Bush campaign in his state. Not that that's a conflict of interest or anything. In fact, in fact, it was obviously the perfect perfect job. Being the chairman of the Bush campaign was the perfect job for the Secretary of State since he's responsible for the election. You know, makes perfect sense. Anyway, he was, um, there was a very serious effort. They were, they were not sure that Ohio was going to go for Bush. And there was a very serious effort to suppress the vote by making registration difficult, by threatening legal action against organizations that registered people to vote, by reducing the number of voting machines available <coughs> in heavily Democratic areas which were mainly in predominantly black areas, and um, allegedly with rigged electronic voting machines, but that, that has not been proven. Now, um, uh, but, and again, the, the stuff that we know about is bad enough. 
So I want to talk about now. So what's Kenneth Blackwell doing <coughs> now? He is another member of Donald Trump's uh, Election Integrity Commission. <laughs> what a great choice! Oh my gosh, this is this is this is great. Okay, so so what we're gonna do? Let me just take. Let me just go to the next. Uh, okay, I already mentioned cross check. Now I want to talk about limiting access to the voting machines. Uh, that was one of the things that Blackwell did, and it was also done in Florida, sure. and it's done all over. And the way this works, the way this works is limiting access to the voting machines. Is oh, oh wait, before we talk about limiting access to the voting machines, I want to. One of the things that Blackwell did was was suppressing voter organizations that register people to vote. Obviously, you don't want to have organizations that help people register to vote because it'll increase the voter turnout, right? So, um, uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Blackwell, when he was Secretary of State for Ohio, tried to suppress these groups or investigate them or, or for, for any kind of criminal activity. Um, our, our Vice President, Mike Pence, did the same thing last year when he was Governor of Indiana. Uh, they, they launched a raid on... Um, on, oh my gosh, and I can't remember. I, don't have a, I can't remember the name of the organization, but he launched a raid on a voter registration organization in Indianapolis, and uh, arrested them and seized their computers Acorn. on charges of voter fraud. Acorn. So, the um, and and uh, and I guess it worked because Indiana voted Indiana uh, voted Republican last year. But now you think, oh my gosh, well isn't Indiana majority Republican? I mean, the weird thing, this is the weird thing, is even in a state that's alleged to be majority Republican, they don't, and I'm not sure, I used to live in Indiana, so I'm not sure it really is. Uh, I met too many Democrats when I was living there. Uh, but they don't want to leave, they don't want to leave the election a chance, because uh, if the Democrats take power, we won't, we'll, we'll, we'll be out of power, you know? So they don't really want to leave it a chance. They, they want to make sure of the outcome. And now, so, so I mentioned already limiting access to the voting machines and, um, and suppressing, the, um, suppressing the voter. Uh, OK. All right, here's, here's another example. One of the things that they did, um, OK, I already talked about Indiana. All right. Um, all right. All right. There's another trick that's used by Republicans, and that is the sending out of disinformation, such as letters telling people to vote on Wednesday rather than Tuesday, and and robocalls warning people they'll be arrested if they try to vote. Now, these things are not done by the state government. They're typically done by the Republican Party, which is a private organization. Um, in Colorado and Virginia, for example, election officials um, sent mail to college students informing them incorrectly that they would lose their financial aid if they registered to vote where they go to school. Um, now, then there's the whole phenomenon of poll watchers, uh, of disqualifying people at the polls. That was done quite, that's been done quite a lot in Florida. And that's another, these, is, these would be partisan poll watchers who challenge individual voters' right to vote. Uh, and that, um, and one of the reasons that Republicans would often give for challenging voters is home foreclosure. They'd say, oh, you're, you foreclosed on your home, so you don't have the right to vote. Now, it's a law? No, it's not a law. No, no, no. A lot of this is, no, a lot of this is done on false pretenses. By, you know, an individual acting on his own can say whatever he wants. And I want to talk about the, the last the, the last thing on which I actually have some personal experience, and that is uh, changing the, and that is the vote count, and this whole business of the voting machines. Now, as you are probably aware, far more jurisdictions are using electronic voting machines now, and they don't leave a paper trail, and so that makes a Florida-style recount impossible. Although not really, because I attended a recount in Wisconsin with paper ballots, and what they used was op optical scan machines. Uh, in theory, they could have they could have counted them by they could have counted them manually one at a time. That would have taken longer. But um, but with the with the all electronic, and, you know, except for the states like Wisconsin that are using the paper ballots, a lot of states are using all electronic uh, voting, and so there is no paper trail. You have to just take it on faith that the vote count is accurate. And now 
I don't know how many of you saw this cartoon. I didn't say I wasn't going to talk about this. I might as well talk about it. This is a perfect illustration of, of what's called the man in this picture. There's the legitimate voter here. And here's the hacker changing the guy's vote over here on the right. If you look at the picture that you all have there in front of you. And that's a perfect illustration of, uh, of, of the, what, the phenomenon of the man in the middle, as it's called. Now, according to computer expert and former conservative activist Stephen Spoonamore, uh, a man named Mike Connell, a computer specialist who worked for Karl Rove, devised a form of computer architecture called the man in the middle. Now, this involves shunting election returns, uh, election return data, through a, a separate <laughs> computer in order to fix the results. Now, that type of tampering would be undetectable. Uh, according to Spoonamore, this was done by Ken Blackwell with the Ohio election returns in 2004 using a contractor's computer. Now, so this, this is also what is alleged to have happened in states that, um, and again, this hasn't been proven yet, but, but in states that were, uh, in, in states that were alleged to have been hacked by the, uh, by Russian hackers. So, so let me just go to, um, so now I want to, now I was, so that's, so that's it, now that, that's the, Electronic side of the of the vote of the vote count alteration, but I want to talk about my own experience. I usually like to you know, um, I often like to wrap up my lectures with a story about my own experience. And last year, I might as well tell my my own side of things. When I was, uh, I got in, you know, when I saw that. When I first saw uh, Donald Trump running for president, I became very, I, I became very alarmed, because first of all, this was he was run, he was he was running on an explicitly racist platform. I don't recall any presidential candidate or any major presidential candidate ever doing that before. And second. He was encouraging violence at his rallies. Eh, somebody go knock the shit out of him. He would say to to uh, to a heckler or a protester, to you know a person who acts the way people at the college of complexes sometimes <laughs> act. And and third, this I found most disturbing. Uh, he was the front runner, and he was the front running Republican from the beginning. I mean. And so I felt I needed to get involved. So I, um, I got involved in the Bernie Sanders campaign because, because I felt that uh, for for a couple of, for a number of different reasons, um, and uh, well, you know, and and I kind of I didn't really do a whole lot. Probably not as much as some of the people here. For one thing, there wasn't time, and 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 it's unfortunate. But some of the some of the Bernie events I attended got canceled, and I would come, and then the, the event, you know, and, uh, and there would be no event. That happened to me once. And, um, then I got involved. So I, I stayed, I remained pro Bernie Sanders right up to the moment he endorsed Hillary Clinton for president. When Sanders endorsed Hillary for president, I immediately said, okay, he's not running for president anymore. I'm supporting Hillary Clinton. Because I figured, and, and I, I don't agree with, I didn't agree with Hillary Clinton on a lot of issues, but I felt she would not, at least, she is not a racist, like, like, you know who. And so I got involved in the Hillary Clinton campaign, and, and I, um, because I felt we got to do whatever it takes to keep Trump out of the White House. And, and, and I really threw myself into it. Actually, it was difficult because the, the Clinton, compared to the Obama campaign, to be honest with you, the Clinton campaign was not as well organized. I know that a lot of people are going to get mad at me. I didn't think the Sanders campaign was as well organized as Obama's campaign either, frankly. Um, and and uh, and a lot of people, because now I'm, you know, and but uh, but I, I did what I could. 
I got involved. I found a group. One of the things that one of the things that bothered me about the, the official Hillary Clinton campaigns first, it was very hard actually to to go on their website and volunteer. It was much harder than with the Obama with the Obama for America website. But eventually, I did do it. And then I went to events. I got I started getting emails from them saying go to this event, and then they would say. Go campaign for Tammy Duckworth for Senate. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be campaigning for Hillary. But what we really need is to get more Democrats elected into the Senate. And I said, and, and my idea, now this is totally different from how, how they handled it. I was living in Illinois in 2008 when Obama ran for president. And the way they handled, the way Obama handled it is, he said, I'm going to win Illinois. Okay, that goes without saying. So, so you people in the safe blue states like Illinois, you volunteers go into the swing states. And we're going to send you to Wisconsin. We're going to send you to Iowa. We're going to send you to Indiana. Whatever. And 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 I did. I didn't go to Iowa, but I went to I went to Indiana. I went to Ohio. I went to Michigan. And that was the idea. The people who came from safe red states or safe blue states would go campaign in the swing states uh, to get Obama elected president. Hillary didn't play it that way. Everybody, you know, the the people were directed to stay in their own state and campaign for for congressmen. And I did, but I felt like this is she's overestimating her chances of winning. I thought this is this is not good because she could because she could because she could lose. I everybody was saying in the summer of, of last summer, everybody was saying, Oh, Hillary's gonna win. America's never gonna elect a fascist racist like Trump. Okay. You know? And and uh, I wasn't so sure because I did the math. Now, this is where I differ from every last pollster. None of the pollsters take into account the effects of vote suppression and the, the, the things that I've mentioned. This is why the polls are off, all of them, every last one of them. The polls do not take into account the effect of vote suppression. They assume that if a person is a registered voter, or if he thinks he's a registered voter, that, that he's going to have the right to vote. Well, that just ain't true, folks. Because because you could think you're a registered voter and then find out that you've been stricken from the polls when you go to vote on election day, and and you're given a provisional ballot. You could think you're a registered voter and come out and and, and do an exit. This is the reason for the discrepancy between the exit polls and the actual returns, because some of those people who responded to the exit polls only voted provisional ballots. Their vote wasn't counted, and and those people are disproportionately Democrats. And, and that is the reason, so, so basically to take that into account, you have to look at the states that are controlled by Republicans to get an accurate count, and you say, okay, of those states, you just basically, here's the thing, the Republicans cannot do this. They, they can do this thing when it's close. They cannot do, in a close election, they can, they can, they can, they can swing it, because they can swing it by up to five points, basically. But in, a, but in an election that they're going to get, where they're going to get clobbered, they can't do it. Um, and even if they control the government. Uh, so you basically, my method of, of trying to figure out who was going to win the election was to take the returns from, from, from Knight Silver's website, which I considered the most accurate, though not 100% accurate, but it was 538.com. Uh, uh, 538 and I would look. I would go on the internet and find out which of those states is controlled by Republicans, 100%. You know, not just a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature, but all Republican government. And I'd say, okay, those states you subtract five points from the Democrats, and then you get a more accurate figure. And what I discovered was that if you do that, that would show Ohio going to, to Trump, Michigan going to Trump, Wisconsin going to Trump, and Iowa going to Trump, and, and, and also uh, Florida going to Trump. Well, guess what happened? Yeah, exactly, Karina. They all went to Trump. And anyway, so I was very concerned. I was, uh, and I felt I needed to do everything. I was unemployed at the time, so I had plenty of free time on my hands, so I just threw myself full force into the election. I was, and what I ended up doing, I hooked up with a group that was doing the right thing. They weren't, they weren't part of the official Hillary Clinton campaign. It was actually Joe Moore, the alderman for the 49th Ward here in Chicago. And, and he was organizing volunteers to go up to Wisconsin. Okay, Wisconsin's a swing state. 
Joe Moore's doing the right thing to get Hillary elected, even if Hillary herself is not doing the right thing. So I went up to, so I joined this group uh, along with my friend Doug Binkley, who I mentioned in, in, at the beginning of this program, and who could not, I actually invited him to come because he could have a few things to say, but he couldn't be here tonight. He had another engagement. And so, so what I did, I, um, so Doug and I went up to, uh, we went up to Wisconsin every Saturday. Every Saturday we went up there and we canvassed in Kenosha, and we canvassed in Racine, and, uh, and we, we campaigned. We eventually hooked up with the Wisconsin supporters of Hillary Clinton so that we were in direct contact with them. Uh, and then, of course, you all know how the election turned out. Now, after the election, the, uh, the Green Party, and this is to their credit, they called for a recount in Wisconsin. Trump, Trump beat Hillary out of the election in Wisconsin by less than one percentage point. And so, so the recount was called. What I discovered was that the recount was a total farce. I participated, I was actually an observer on behalf of the Hillary Clinton campaign at the recount in Racine County, Wisconsin, and I discovered the whole thing was a bunch of crap. Let me tell you why. First of all, the provisional ballots were not counted. I think I already mentioned that, but they didn't even bother counting them. So, second, this is really in, this this is really interesting. The clerk told the tabulators that the tabulators I forgot to mention are the, those that's the name of the people who count the vote. And the clerk told the tabulators that the recount must not exceed the original count. In, <laughs> in other words, let's say you had ten thousand. Let's say you had a hundred votes for precinct eight, one. Uh, on, on election day, and now sudden, uh, the the and, and now we get 110 ballots. Because when we count them over, it cannot be 110. It has to be 100. So so and, and and if it does, if the recount exceeds the original count, they have to pull the ballots until the numbers match. They were instructed to do that. Now to pull the ballots, they would use whatever excuses they could. No signature write-ins, incorrectly filled in, etc. Just to give you an example, they use paper ballots, so there's none of this electronic ballot shenanigans, okay? But let's suppose the, the person using the black magic marker, instead of, they're supposed to write a straight line across the ballot, and instead they write an X. Now the intent of the voter is clear. He wrote, he just wrote an X by mistake, but you know who he was trying to vote for. But they would pull that ballot because he didn't do it right. Now, now here's another thing that they did tabulators and the election officials were instructed to refuse all requests from Green and Democratic observers. There were Republican observers too, but they were obeyed. In fact, they were giving instructions to, uh, to the people in charge. Uh, now, another big problem, and this is not on the Republicans, it, this, this the Democrats must be blamed for. And that was that Democratic volunteers like myself were poorly trained and mostly unqualified to do their work. Um, you know, it, I had to learn the hard way. I came in with no training. I had no idea what the hell was going on. And then finally, and this really irritated me, because the Greens didn't follow this rule. The Greens were actually better about this. Democratic volunteers were told not to challenge anything, but only to observe, and then to give a report back to, uh, to the person, to the person who is, you know, to our supervisor at the end. So, it's, um, so, so in other words, I had to watch all this stuff. I played along, and I, maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe I should have challenged it. Although, if I had done that, I would have been thrown out of the courthouse. And uh, I had to watch them do all this crap, and there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. And um, now, why did they have these problems with the Democrats? I mean, you know, that I mentioned one is that the recount wasn't really planned for it was hastily organized. So I'll give them, yeah. cut them some slack there. And the other thing, and I think I kind of mentioned this, if anybody other than the Republicans was to challenge practices in a, in a Republican-controlled county, the county officials would throw them out, okay? Because the county officials were Republicans, too. And naturally, they're going to side with their own people. They're not, they're not on our side. So... You know, they're not impartial. This is one of the big problems uh, when you have elections that are run by people that are very partial and want, you know, want the outcome to be what it is. So what the hell are we going to do about all this? You know, that's, that's the $64 billion question right there. And I don't have an answer, you know. I do. 
right. Okay, but but I, I just want to say that um, I do think that I do think that what what one thing you can do is because it, it really this really strikes at the heart of our democracy. And by the way, it's only getting worse. What they're going to do? This presidential commission is going to make the policies of the Republican-controlled states nationwide policies. So it's going to get even harder. It's going to become even harder. And and I, and 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 don't think you're off the hook just because you're white. Some of the some of the people in this room uh, will lose their right to vote too. Okay, Charlie is signaling to me that we need to wrap it up. One thing I would say is you can get involved with. Um, is we need to campaign here in Illinois to change um, to change the uh, to, to 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 stop using cross check. That would be a good start. And um, um, you know, all right. Well, anyway, anyway, that's that's all I have to say about all right. that. Yeah. They for questions. Oh, uh, okay. All right. okay. Okay. Well, I got a question. Who, wait a minute, the mo isn't it the moderator's job to call to... to well, you're, you're, you, you know enough that you can probably self-moderate. Huh. Okay, well here comes All right. Andy. All right, well, um, well how, are you, how are you guys doing it now, Andy? I mean, it's... Same well, way. If you want to point out people, I'll just sit back here and watch. Okay, well, um, all right, all right, I'll just call on people. Okay, go ahead, Tim. You had your hand up. You know, I've often, I, I remember speaking with you about this topic. Yep. Can you just elaborate a little bit more as to your perceived presumption that Hillary was going to be the supposed winner? And can you just elaborate a little bit more on why you think she lost? Well, first of all, okay, you're, you're, that's a two-part question, okay. Tim. I mean, it's really there's two. That's really two different questions. The first one is why did most people in the United States think Hillary was going to win the election? And number two, why did she lose the election? I just explained, I already answered number two. My entire lecture was about number two. Okay. All right? Um, now, as for number one, the reason, I kind of answered that question in my lecture. And the reason most people fought it is because most people believe that the polls were accurate. Well, as a matter of fact, the polls are, in my opinion, when you take an, aggreg an aggregate of the polls, was a fairly accurate reflection of public opinion, but it was not an accurate reflection of how the election would turn out, be and, and that's that's the reason for the discrepancy between polls. By the way, in every country of the world other than the United States, uh, when there's a discrepancy between exit polls and actual returns, that's considered prima facie evidence of voter fraud, of excuse me, not election fraud, except for this country. Uh, okay, uh, Karina, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Um. Are there any class action lawsuits right now from voters who felt that they were unfairly disenfranchised from voting? Well, there's uh, there's one going on from an organization whose name I cannot remember at this point, but somebody might remember it uh, uh, about against the um, against the Democratic National Committee, uh, alleging that they stole the they stole the election from Bernie Sanders. Uh, the problem now there are some other organizations. Uh, Here's, here's the thing. When they pass these laws, it's the law, okay? So they're not breaking the law, all right? I mean, so how do you, how do you, fight, how do you fight them when, they're, when what they're doing is actually legal? And so, so what? But the Supreme Court can knock down some laws. Yeah, that's possible. I, you know, and I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention something. The Supreme Court has actually already ruled on this, uh, Corrine, and I'm glad you brought this up because I forgot to mention it in my lecture. One of the key elements to Republican victory last year was the Supreme Court's ruling on this subject. They ruled that the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is supposed to prevent this kind of stuff, is unconstitutional. Okay, so uh, who else is? Doc, Dr. Laura. Yeah, hi. Okay, so I'm, I'm really confused about your position here because you started out saying that there was no evidence for election fraud. Mm -hmm. um, no, I didn't say that. Okay, wow, well, I kind of took that down. But anyways, um, so you do believe that there is evidence of election fraud, vote manipulation. Okay, well I didn't say that either. Okay. But what I well, said... Well, hold on, let me ask my question then. Okay, so you did. 
say that there was no evidence for the electronic voting fraud or the vote manipulation. I didn't say there was no evidence. I said it's not proven. Oh, okay. okay. There's a, I make a distinction between, now a lot of people are not clear on this, but I make a distinction between, there's a difference between evidence and proof. Evidence is not the same thing as proof. Uh, Right. The only proof, the only proof 100% for election fraud is actually to count the ballots, but they never let you do that as you observed in Wisconsin and Michigan and, and Pennsylvania for the recounts. So there's never 100% proof of election fraud. Okay. What's your but question? There, my question is, did you read Democracy Lost by Election Justice USA, the 100-page report? Did you read the legal review um, from Harvard by statisticians about the election fraud in the Democratic Party? Did you read the book Code Red? Did you read the blog electionfraud2016.wordpress.com? Did you read um, what happened in Ohio? Did you read the Des Moines Register and the thousands of articles about the election fraud in the Democratic Party before you came to this conclusion? I did read. Uh, I did read Democracy Lost. Yeah, and uh, and and I concluded that 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 there's evidence, and I think it's poss I think that the allegations they make in Democracy Lost are possible, but yeah. it's but they they haven't really. It, it's not proven. I mean, I, I I think it would be worth investigating, but I do not believe that it, that it is that they've proven it yet. That's okay. So let's go on to the next question, sir. You had your hand up. Well, Aren't the Democrats bringing in these 11 million illegal aliens and all these refugees because they yeah. know they're going to vote Democratic? Isn't that true? That's well, true. That's and true. even if that were true, okay, okay that's, that's, uh, that's yeah, not illegal. true. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Yeah. Charlie. Okay, okay. Uh, this gentleman claims that the Democrats are bringing in illegal aliens. That's not true. That's that's total. That's total crap. That's like that's Alex Jones. Okay, go on. Okay, Charlie. No, no, no. I, I answered your question. Let's go on to the next question. Hey, wait. Hey, uh, excuse me. Hey, one fool at a time, sir. Uh, okay. Now, no personal attacks. Okay. And uh, all right. So uh, okay. Um, Okay, yes, sir. Uh, I'm wondering if this has ever been challenged in court, that because someone is a felon, mm -hmm. they cannot vote. They are still a citizen. Yeah, yeah, of course they're still but a has citizen. That, has, that ever been, has that ever been challenged in court? Because they're a citizen, they can't vote. No, it's, it's constitutional. It's, it, it, the states don't have to have laws banning felons, but it is permitted by the Constitution. The 15th Amendment allows uh, felony convictions as an exception uh, to taking away people's right to vote. The, the, fel the 15th Amendment to the Constitution guarantees um, uh, guarantees the right to vote except in a case of a felony conviction okay. where you can't have your right to vote taken away. Well, okay. So that's, that's They're that's still a, citizens. Well, I understand. Yes, 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 sir, I understand that. But but the, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, look, if you were to bring it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would look and they'd say, well, no, no, it's right here in the 15th Amendment, so the states have the right to do okay. that. Okay, how about an amendment? If you're a citizen, you have a right to vote. That's yeah. it. Well, that's a possibility. What I would advocate, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I, I tend, I'm, I'm a believer in our federal system of government. I think the United States is a very diverse country, and what I would advocate is that people uh, in their own state uh, try to get their state to, uh, to, to drop those laws that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that disenfranchise uh, people who have been convicted. Uh, all right, let's go to the next question. Dave. Yes. Now, I disagree with my friend George over here when he says that uh, what about all the illegal aliens and, and the 11 million and so on that they brought into vote? Well, I'm an old time Chicago and Cook County Democrat. What the hell's wrong with that? <laughs> okay, well, then I guess I'll take that for a rhetorical question. Yeah, ma'am, you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Oh, I. Don't I was curious, I, are all states well, all felonies or are some states... No, 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 it's only some of the states have those laws. Right, but what I'm saying is there's all kinds of degrees of felonies. Right, Minor right. Minor felonies it, but also, up to really um, heavy-duty felonies. Well... So are they excluding in, all of them? In, in most cases, it, no, 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 in most cases that felony is a felony is a felony. Now, in some states, you only lose your right to vote while you're in, while you're incarcerated or under sentence, and then when the, when your sentence is up, you get your right to vote back. In other states, you lose your right to vote in that state for the rest of your life. 
Uh, okay. Uh, okay, who else? Charlie, uh, wait, let me just, before, Charlie, you had one question. Didn't you have a question before or no? Oh, yeah. you have a question. Okay, let's, uh, uh, okay, Mike, go ahead. If they find out that this election was hacked or stolen yeah. or fraud, Mm -hmm. Is Hillary president then? No. 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 no, I'm afraid not. The Constitution, there's no provision in the Constitution for replacing the president. However, uh, as some of you may be aware, there is, a, there is a movement to impeach Donald Trump, but that would have to be for high crimes and misdemeanors that committed by Trump himself. And I maintain that this wasn't done by Trump, it was done by it, w it was done by the Republican parties of, of, the, diff of, of the, the, the various states that did this. And, and that Trump had nothing to do with it, and that, and that any Republican presidential candidate would have benefited from it in the same way. In other words, the result would have been nothing. Now, the Russian hacking thing, that's another matter. But uh, because they, they may have intervened to help Trump. Not, but, the, but what I'm talking about, it would, have, it would have benefited any Republican presidential nominee, not just Trump. Uh, Okay, uh, okay, who's, who else has got a question? All right, I don't see any other hands up than Charlie's, uh, and, and yours, I'll get to you next, but, uh, oh wait, sir, did you have a question? No. No, oh, okay, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, has anybody looked into now, in the indications I've been in a polling place that's one of the functionaries, I mean, I, I could, you know, so there were some kids there and they be an, an elderly lady, but I could get away with virtually murder on what went on. Well, murder, wait a minute, I don't understand what I could do whatever I wanted, nobody challenged me. Okay, what's your question? Like running the polling place. Does anybody look into who is actually running our polling places? What, it, what experience they have? What background? I'm serious. I, I, they didn't even care what tallies I handed in, they assumed I was in charge. Oh, well that, know, that's a I mean, serious issue and that, that's, I'm glad you I mean, there were a couple really nice kids, cool. yeah. you know, I bought them lunch, you know, they had a free lunch and they were happy. And that's a serious issue, Charlie, and I'm glad you brought it up. And look, if, if the people who run the polling place, you know, I don't think that in most cases the people running the polling places have malicious intent. I was one of those people at one time. I, I was an election judge in the 2008 election. I was paid to do it, um, and and I and the rest of us we all felt that we were you know we were doing a good thing. And I've met with a lot of I've met a lot of other people involved in that process. And um, I haven't, but I would say that if they don't, if they don't you know if if that if they behave the way that you're talking about, that would make it easier for. Uh, for partisan poll watchers to cause trouble. Now, uh, okay. Now you had your, you had. Did you have another question, yeah. sir? By the way, this is hey, Andy. Why don't we make this the last question, okay? And then move yeah. on to rebuttal. Okay, okay go go ahead, sir. Didn't the Obama administration use the IRS to harass Republican voters to suppress the vote? Yeah. No. Okay, let's go on to the next. Okay, let's go to the rebuttal period. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did. Yeah, he's he did right. Give our speaker a big hand. Okay, uh, let's have a show of hands to see who wants to give rebuttals. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm first, Dr. Laura. I'm first. Keep your hands up because I'm first. that's how many are going to come thought, up here. I thought we were going to... I'm first. Hold on. One, two, three, four. There's four on this side. Five, six, seven, eight, and me. Okay, that's nine people. And then the speaker will get the last word. Four, four minutes, you think? Okay, go, we'll go four minutes apiece for I won't be long. Yeah, I'm going first. <laughs> I came up here. I thought we were lining up. We used to line up. Yeah, we do, but I'm going okay, first. Okay, I'm going to correct the record on some stuff, okay? <laughs> so, um, on the flyer that I uh, handed out to you, there are um, lots of links. Code Red is a book that um, the gentleman over here talked about. This um, really outlines by multiple, <coughs> multiple studies, multiple findings, many, many, um, that the Republicans are ripping the vote in about 26 states, okay? That's code red. 
okay? Then the second link in my flyer to you is Democracy Lost. And that is the documentation by lawyers, statisticians, and journalists of the Democratic Party fraud against Bernie Sanders in the primaries. And they uh, document um, 11 to 13 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. So really, those two books are essential to read before you have an opinion about whether there's election fraud or not, okay? We all need to back our opinions up by some fact. Um, the Code Red also has a very, very good bibliography behind it. Um, and that would be those are other sources of evidence as well. The third book that I would recommend, to, if you really want to know whether there's election fraud or not, is What Happened in Ohio by Representative John Conyers. That's a very small book. You could read it in an hour. And it really is a how to flip an election. And um, he documented eight fraud in 88 counties out of 103 in Ohio in 2004, and he wrote a book about it. That's your third reference. And then the fourth reference is this book, The Strip and Flip by Harvey Wasserman and Bob Fitrakis. Okay? So four things could bring you up to snuff on all the evidence, or most of the evidence, about the election fraud. Election fraud versus voter fraud. Voter fraud is where supposed illegal immigrants go in and vote twice, or somebody votes yeah. twice. And there are isolated cases of that, but there's no documentation of large numbers of people doing this, okay? There are isolated cases. I myself have reported isolated cases. But the election fraud is flipping millions of votes. And the election fraud is perpetrated by Republican and Democratic operatives. They say that the Russians did it, but the Russians, there's actually no real proof that the Russians actually flipped any votes. Um, if you look at the reports, there's no proof that they actually flipped votes. And beware of what you read about the Russian hacking. Remember when I was here and I was talking to you just a couple months ago? The Illinois State Board of Elections that uh, supposedly was hacked into by the Russians told me that they were told there was no real evidence that it was the Russians. They didn't know who did it, and, there was, and they were told that by the NSA. And then now, all of a sudden, we have this evidence of the Russians hacking into voter databases. So beware about the Russian hacking. I do believe that they have the ability to hack in, but I don't know if there's any real proof that it was them. Because if you remember right, when WikiLeaks dumped Vault 7, in there was uh, a number of um, documentation that the NSA has the ability to change IP numbers to make it look like somebody's hacking into you when they're not. Go back to Vault 7, WikiLeaks, okay? And uh, don't trust the NSA, don't trust the FBI, and so, but there's no proof at all that they, um, they flip the, any votes, okay? But there's lots of proof that Republican operatives are flipping votes and Democratic Party operatives are flipping votes. So we, this is the thing, this is the stuff we want to talk about at the Election Integrity Conference, okay? If you follow the links on the flyer that I gave you, you will get more information about actual election fraud. Voter registration, um, voter registration problems are occurring across the country. Um, this is what this book is called. It's called The Strip and Flip, okay? The strip is vo uh, stripping people from their voting rights, and the flip is manipulating the vote count. Okay? The strip and the flip. They're both happening. Thanks so much. Laura, Wiki is under control of the election. Ellen Corley, this is my fourth or fifth time here. I love this free speech forum. Uh, thank you, um, Don. You actually introduced me to this group. Uh, we met at the Irish Heritage Foundation, the United for Democracy Now, a few weeks ago, or a couple months ago, and uh, I've enjoyed both those organizations. Uh, I had gotten involved with Obama Organizing for Action last year, and uh, and then and they had started with the Hillary Clinton campaign, and it, just one thought is, 
I think part of the reason the Hillary campaign didn't do as well is there was a lot of, the Democrats were playing by the rules really closely and trying not to, like they didn't want us to write, you know, anything about Hillary and Obama because, you know, meanwhile, the Republicans are just cheating up a storm. And, it, and so I, I think they kind of shot themselves in the foot by playing too fair, uh, whereas I have a background, my stepfather, I'm an adult child of a Republican family, I say. It, it's like being abused, right? And I, on both sides, I've got a Rush Limbaugh side and a gun toting side, and on the other is a Trump-Hillary campaign, my stepfather's horrible girlfriend, Tea Party, you know, just stole, ran off with all our money so she could run for office. And uh, so anyhow, I got, I developed a social conscience. And, but um, I guess, you know, and I've been researching and investigating and digging, and I do think there's an advantage to, I mean, this, I just watched, um, Give Me Roger Stone is on Amazon. What a snake, you know, Paul Manafort. I mean, the people that that work for Trump, you know, I think with, before August, uh, he was, you know, saying things that were uh, kind of plastic. But um, I knew that the whole Republican lineup and party are their Manchurian candidates. Uh, they've been put in there by the Koch brothers and uh, Manafort goes back to Nixon and Stone, and you know, you these guys are dirty tricksters. That's their way of being. And I, I still today, I'm like, why can't we fight them at the courts? Corruption. There used to be yeah. honest services laws. There were citizen protection law was tried to put in by um, Larouche Pack, and they um, because they go after other politicians. I mean, this is it's such a dirty game. I don't know how they get to keep throwing out regulations that are so hard to put in. Uh, so that's, I'm looking to be like Clarence Darrow, you know? I mean, we, we have to figure out how to get in the courts and fight for civil rights at that level. I see the pattern of the, Repub the Federalist Society pushing everything down to the states. And they, you know, have stacked that deck I, I really think this is one of I test hypotheses. I'm a market research background, and I think you have to start with the hypothesis. And one is they're all CIA. Uh, you know, after World War II, Hitler and uh, what Reinhard Gellin and Carl Schmitt influenced the CIA. They brought over thousands of the worst Nazis of intelligence and um, and the law and the, this Federalist Society is coming out of them and they it's this great divide and conquer trick so when they talk about russia i think yeah this is an old russia nazi whatever it is divide and conquer it's war if this isn't politics this is war and they're using i think if the i want to expose it if the world knew these are nazis you might think and we could get it on the paper if the propaganda wasn't so controlled we could say you know of course we don't want nazis okay that's all i got thank you I remember when I was a kid, I started, first started to vote. This was on the west side of Chicago, and on our block, the corner of Cook County lived Alexander Brody. And the, uh, the block captain, whatever they called him at that time, when we, my mother had to have a car in order to get the vote, and I would go with her. But they would, what they would do is give you five dollars each. <laughs> so instead of Cook County, we had Crook County. <laughs> That's what it was all about. And um, during holidays, they would pass out, uh, it was a Jewish neighborhood, they'd pass out the uh, Nazis and they'd pass out different things to get you to vote, to bribe you to go and vote. Now, in the 1990s, when Yeltsin was running for president of um, Russia, American 
advisors came to Russia and they told them how to win. And they had slick pamphlets all printed up to give to, to the Yeltsin forces saying, this, saying what would happen if the communists won, there would be civil war. And of course, in the Soviet Union, they remember the Second World War and the misery and the devastation of that particular war. So a lot of them voted for Yeltsin because they would, um, they fell for the propaganda there would be a civil war in Russia. And we uh, influence elections all around the world. Like recently, just recently, they got the uh, president of Brazil, uh, I think her name is Duma Yosef or something uh, like Duma that. Duma Rousseff. Rousseff. And the CIA worked it so she was be thrown out of office, and then when she was thrown out of office, it was revealed that the new president had all kinds of corruption behind him and all kinds of crookedness behind him. So the United States has a long history of overthrowing governments, trying to uh, influence elections all around the world, and now they're claiming that Russia interfered in our election. It's such hypocrisy, it's ridiculous. So uh, you can't really believe what the mass media tells you about anything. You have to read alternative uh, publications or maybe Amy Goodman's on, uh, on television to really get your news because if you believe all the BS from the corporate media, You'll never know what's going on. So the elections have become a fraud in the United States. What is happening now is the oligarchy really controls the country and is trying to push it into fascism. But they do it little by little. They don't do it all the way. Like now they're trying to do away with the Affordable Care Act. So I, I live in a nursing home, and I went up to the director and asked him about it. He says it won't influence the, uh, the nursing homes because of the affordable care, the, the aid that you get from the government isn't being taken away from the uh, nursing homes. So the whole thing is real crooked, and you have to watch out because the oligarchy not only influences elections in the United States, like I said, but it tries to influence the elections in every single country okay, in the world that it can. your time, said. Right, go. Who's next? I'm going to go next. Okay. I'm going to talk about tonight the other side that is not talked about so often about our elections. And that is the low participation rate in the United States of our electorate. We're sitting here talking about voter integrity and voter potential voter fraud, when really, in a lot of cases, especially in municipal elections, it's less than 20% in off-year elections that the important questions get decided. When we have presidential elections, it's still less than 60% of people who are participating in the country. If you really want to change the way the United States is going, if you really want to make America great again, and this goes not only for you at the College of Complexes, but our web audience out there, get out, register, and vote. Then get involved civically, whether it be in some kind of government or even private organization. Because when, what really is it that makes America great? 
according to the Cokeville, when he went around in the early 1830s around our country, he said it's because America was a country of joiners, that the wisdom came from the community. At that time, people were mostly going to church and getting a lot of their wisdom from the pulpits of America. I know that's changed with the web today a little bit, but still, the most best way to keep evil at bay is for good men to do nothing. When good men no, no, do no, no, nothing, no, no, no. You evil <laughs> prevails. So it's up to you, all of you, to participate, to vote, and if you really want change, it boils down to you as the individual citizen in this country to make America great again. And that could be as anything from simple as having a good deed done to a person crossing the street, or perhaps to maybe yielding that spot in traffic that you might normally honk your horn on, maybe being a little bit more patient to the next person beside you. Yes, there's a lot of ways to make America great again, but we have to also be good again. Remember, your individual conduct, the way you run your own lives, has a lot to where our culture is. And frankly, I'm kind of sick of this self-centered culture we have about how we're getting screwed and not getting over deals, when what we really should be doing is out-competing, out-competitively out going around. The thing is today, if we are in competition with others, if we don't do something, somebody else is going to come up. If we don't engage the world, for example, China will with their one belt, one road policy. In other words, the forces of globalization are around us. We best accept the reality, and it's best that we all engage to do better, not only in our country, but also personally. Thank you. Wow, right on the air. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. What are you talking about? <laughs> 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 I'd like to start out by talking about an uh, experience I had. Uh, Shut up. I've been in uh, Arizona for the last few years. And uh, I registered to vote, of course. And when I went to vote, I found they moved the polling place. But I found it. And when I got there, they pointed out to me that I had registered for a, um, uh, what do you call it, a mail-in ballot, which I had done. And in fact, I remembered when I signed up for it, they kind of convinced me this would be a great idea and much more convenient. And uh, I was a little suspicious of that. I, I really don't trust just leaving it in a box somewhere and yeah. hoping that they count it. So I did sign up for the early, early voting. So when I got to the polling place, because I, I did not mail it in, right? So I went to the polling place, and they said, well, you signed up for early voting. And I said, yeah, I did, but uh, I didn't send it in. You know, that's it. You know, you got to go one way or the other, and that's it. And so I was given a provisional ballot, which means the basically thrown away. And it's the first time I've been voting since, uh, I don't even remember the first time I voted, I guess it's been a long time. And it was the first time I was not allowed to vote. Yeah. And uh, I, I could see by the numbers, and I don't remember the percentages, but a huge number of, uh, of votes in Arizona are done on these early ballots. And um, I think that whole system, that part of the system particularly is, has a lot of uh, possibilities of, uh, of fraud. And, and the fraud is coming from the top down, as has been mentioned before. Yeah. That's all I got to say, but thank you. All right. That's for you. I agree with most of what our speakers have said, and I want to thank Don in particular for a very illuminating talk. Uh, the only thing I would add to that, however, is there's some people here who have cited WikiLeaks as a source. <laughs> and I find there's about as much truth in WikiLeaks 
as there was in Pravda or Izvestia during the days of the Soviet Union. I don't trust that any more than I trust any other kind the of actual thing. The actual document never been disproven. Who says it's factual? One fool in a car. Who says it's factual? Finally, I would also say that if I were president, if I were God, right? Um, that political integrity committee would be staffed with about as many Cook County Democrats as I could pack on there. <laughs> and with instructions to dump as many Republican names off that list as I could possibly manage. <laughs> I mean, this has been going on for Cook County. This has been going on in Chicago and Cook County for years. And finally, when Tom said they moved the polling place in there, on him in Arizona, well, right. what's new about that? Yeah. Yeah. We have an open mic. We need to get more rebutters. More rebutters? Yeah. Uh, thanks, yeah. Don. A very interesting talk. Uh, I really was stunned at a lot of the stuff I didn't know. It's amazing how ignorant I am. I do want to repeat, uh, I believe, what Carl Schur said, a Republican from the last, or second from the last century. He said, my country, right or wrong, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. I agree with that. Of course, Carl Schur, as I recall, was a racist, but no one's perfect. So the question here, I think, really comes down to uh, and I don't have the big answer, but I got a small answer. Who do you trust? We heard of the state of Arizona. Well, what the hell? I wouldn't trust anything from Arizona. No, not from what I know. It's bad enough in Illinois. Who do you trust? Well, I better trust myself. Uh, I find myself, in spite of the audience here, uh, moving from a male world to a female world. I'm glad to see some women here because I j basically trust women more than I trust men. Here, here. So that's one thing. But I certainly trust Jane Adams Senior Caucus. This is a great organization to belong to. Incidentally, two thirds of the members, roughly perhaps three-quarters are women, and old women to beat the band. So that's one thing. The Second Unitarian Church of Chicago, that's the one I belong to. Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice. I believe in this group. I know the, these people. One North Side, a community organization. These are the ones who I trust. Do I trust Chicago and its or in its leaders? No. Do I trust Illinois and its leaders? No. Do I trust the United States and its leaders? No. They need to all be fixed. So the issue really that Don was talking about to me comes down to all the details I didn't understand. But who do you trust? One more thing. Look at the audience. Of course, I can't see where the tooth, but almost everybody here is white. That is not the United States. That is not what we are. What we are is a much more racially uh, different group than we have here. But I certainly trust this group more than I trust, say, the United States of America. Thank you. Dr. Laura. Okay, I've got more to say. Um, okay, I wanted to tell you about our project, but I wanted to say a few things. Provisional ballots in Cook County and Chicago, um, they're uh, just a roundabout number, about 10,000 in Chicago, about 10,000 in uh, Cook County, suburban Cook County, and about 30% of them are counted. Only three. Two thirds of them are thrown out. Okay? Yeah, somebody asked for the number. Um, who's running the polling places? It is election judges. Election judges are sometimes they volunteer, which is great. Sometimes they're patronage 
um, positions, okay? So the committeemen, the Democratic committeemen, and the Republican committeemen uh, name a lot of the election judges. Um, in my experience, and I go to about 40 precincts uh, election day, so I have a lot of uh, across Chicago, and um, the Republican, the Republican election judges in Chicago are actually really well trained. They go through the uh, Board of Elections training, and they go through the Republican training, and they're they're really actually really really well trained. It's the Democratic judges that are sometimes a little bit uh, not as well trained. This is why we need poll watchers. Okay, my little sign up sheet: poll watchers. Uh, it's important to uh, inform the election judges when they veer from the election law. Okay, um, I wanted to tell you about Cook, uh, Clean County, Cook County. So we are suing the Chicago Board of Elections for that unproven fraud that our speaker talked about. It's actually proven. And we've been in court for a year now, and we've survived uh, several motions to dismiss. Uh, the Chicago Board of Elections hired a high-powered uh, New York firm. I anticipate they're going to delay us for years. We still haven't gotten to discovery yet, um, but what they did do for us, or because of us, is that we're getting rid of the touchscreen machines with the toilet paper rolls in all of Cook County. Uh, in the next election, thank you very much, thank you very much. In the next election, we caught them red-handed, erasing Bernie votes and adding Hillary votes. We caught the cover-up, you guys. When they do the 5% audit, we caught the cover-up. So. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to have uh, paper ballots in uh, you know all of the um, election day voting, but for early voting, you're going to go in and you're going to vote on a, a machine, and it's going to give you you're going to be able to use all sorts of different languages, and it uh, it will produce your paper ballot. You will be able to look at it, make sure it's voted correctly, and then put it in the scanner, right? And our project that we're working with uh, David Orr on is an election security for that whole system. We're going to be counting ballots. We're going to be scanning ballots with our own scanner that is not owned by any proprietary corporation outside of the system of Cook County, okay? We're going to be counting some of those ballots. We're going to be uh, comparing those ballots to the ballots that they have in their records. That's what our project is all about. And we're in negotiation with David Orr right now. We, I anticipate we're gonna need somewhere around three, 200 to 300 volunteers to get this done for Chicago and for Cook County. We're talking about somewhere around in a heavy election of two million votes that we have to secure. So uh, that's what I wanted you to sign up for, is to volunteer for that. And I thank you very much for your time. Clean County, Cook County on Facebook. Okay, Charlie. Charlie, you're next on the rebuttal. Oh, all right. Okay, let's thank our speaker uh, for his presentation. Very good. All right, I'll be uh, eclectic as usual here. Uh, Wik Wiki Links is not a legitimate journalistic organization. You do not break into computers. That is not a source of information on which you conduct journalism. If I was a reporter, if I was a reporter, if I said, Where, where'd you get the basis of the story? He'd say, well, I hacked, in the, I hacked into somebody's computers, you know? you think you'd run that story. They were disseminating what is known as privileged executive communication. Yep, you're right. And it's unethical. If you don't do Thank both that. sides, you don't do it. Let me give you a story. We had a disgruntled employee, and he, he gave the other side priv privileged executive communication. It was returned because they said we did not get this in the manner in which we are not entitled to this information. And there's ethical standards that have to be adhered to. I don't think good government is served by such nefarious methods. Uh, we have campaigns. If you can't, as a matter of fact, that shouldn't, shouldn't even really use the basis of any reporting. That's what I mean. There's, there's some basic standards you got to have your feet on the ground when you do this. And when somebody wants to break the rules and pretend that that's reform, uh, I've got to wonder about it. No, I'm sorry about that. And now switch to the other thing. Um, voter ID, I have absolutely no idea. And I thought about this. I was on the committee. We'd have these bi-weekly calls on voter legislation. I cannot ascertain the necessity 
even though those on the right seem to think it's absolute necessity, and I mean this, they really think you got to have a voter ID. You really cannot legitimately, well, you'd have to go from polling place to polling place or something. I go, who does this? Uh, I just can't ascertain how a voter ID, and I'm serious, I've thought about this, is solving a problem of any magnitude. I, I may have heard sometimes people would go from one polling place to another and pretend they couldn't speak English and they'd give them a ballot. But even then, I guess in the ward, maybe how many votes could you really get? You know, I mean, I, that's what I mean. It, it's solving a problem which I just can't fathom that exists. Now, one experience that I've had for many, many years is in conducting elections for locals of unions. And I've often called in as a third party to sit in on this and monitor them. Uh, one thing we do, thinking of voter ID, when we have union elections, they have a guy who's called the sergeant at arms, and they really don't have anything to do except during an election. And in my union, at least, they check the credentials of people, and that's a very difficult thing job, but then they lock the doors, and believe you me, all votes are conducted within the locked doors so that they ensure the integrity of the voting. Now, the only thing that has happened over the years, amazingly enough, is that I've been designated to keep the tally of the results. <laughs> God, that's a mocking term. There's your problem. <laughs> and here's the amazing thing is, at no time, now these are delegates from all around Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and they entirely trust the results, the figures that I give them of the results. <laughs> and they have never asked once for my records, which I found to be amazing. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> um, but anyhow, uh, next week we're going to be covering more of the electronic issue of this thing. Um, and it's certainly a multifaceted topic with many, many aspects to it. Uh, it's uh, we're, we're far from settling this. I think we're at the beginning of the, the thing here, and we've got a long way to go to see what these Russians precisely were up to. Uh, they weren't breaking into 39 states uh, because of uh, they were looking for something to do, and they just had, they had, an, had nothing to do that afternoon. Uh, yeah, they were up to nefarious activities. The latest thing in the buzz that's out there, if you haven't followed this, is that they actually had, now this is a great one, they had assistance from someone in the United States. Uh, now that I, remains to be seen, and conceivably someone from one of the political campaigns, which, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see. Anyhow, we'll take this up next week. Thank you very much. Thanks again, guys. Yeah. Going up. All right. Four minutes. <laughs> I worked as an election judge uh, during the last national election. Uh, the um, Cook County was pretty desperate to get election judges. Uh, not many people wanted to do that work. Uh, it paid $200, but I arrived um, at 5 a.m. and didn't leave until 9 p.m. Uh, a lot of people in the rooms feel very strongly about a paper ballot. Uh, now everybody talks about what a low turnout the election was, but in my precinct I had almost 500 ballots, no, over uh, about almost 500 even, I think it was 499 ballots. Um, and we had to count each one, we had to count and, and account for all the ballots. Uh, the provisional ballots are uh, not counted unless somebody claims, uh, the voters often don't know that they have to claim provisional ballots. Um, and in my precinct, we tried very hard to avoid provisional ballots. We went out of our way. We told you exactly where your, I personally told everyone I knew about early voting so they could 
vote anywhere they wanted uh, early during uh, during the um, open uh, polling centers before the election day, um, and they didn't have to worry about showing up at the right precinct. During election day, we told them exactly where they should go. We bent over backwards to avoid provisional ballots as much as possible. It was just another separate item that needed to be counted. Um, and uh, in terms of whether you're a Democratic or a Republican judge, that's very arbitrary. You sign up to be a judge and you can either click Democrat or Republican or Independent. And um, you, we all go to the same training. Um, it's just um, a lot of work um, showing up early, setting up all the equipment, uh, which isn't super intuitive. Um, and um, one thing that we didn't talk about and this wasn't part of the talk, was uh, same-day, uh, election day, voter yeah, registration, yeah. which is something that I, as an election judge, was strongly against, uh, but the powers of being Springfield voted for it, but people who had not registered to vote could show up on election day and register that day if they wanted to vote. Uh, they did need to have some documentation, uh, but um, Anyway, I guess that's um, what I had to say. I, there, I wasn't I wasn't a Republican judge. There wasn't any special Republican uh, training. I, I just checked the Republican box as opposed to the Democrat because I, because we always have more than enough Democratic judges. So I just wanted to counterbalance that because if somebody needs the judges to assist them to, to vote, then they need to have one Republican judge and one Democratic judge watching them vote. But as I said, I left at 9, 9 p.m. and I was with a group of experienced, um, I was with a well-coordinated um, good group of election judges and it still took us a long time because we had to count all those paper ballots. And we had a large turnout, even if the national turnout was low. Andy. I got you, Andy, don't worry. First off, um, as they report from uh, Project Censor out of Sonoma State, there, there's a chapter in that book every year on the top ten junk food news stories. Junk food news, uh, Lindsay Lohan going back to rehab, uh, Kim Kardashian family, or the Russians might have hacked into our election. They, they, they cover the airwaves with junk 24-7 as a smokescreen so that nobody is talking about the fact that the stolen election was done by American criminals inside the country. It was a wholly American inside job by American criminals and then covered up by criminals that own the media. If we had honest investigative reporting in this country, uh, the stories could be understood by anybody with an eighth grade education. As Professor Griffin used to say on, on the subject of forensic evidence of 9-11, you need a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education. That's how easy it is to understand if somebody gives you the facts that are you know, unvarnished with all kinds of mythological opinions. We are, uh, the media daily showers us, we live in a bubble, we're, we're buried in criminally insane bullshit. 24 hours a day. I call it cribs. All we were, we're, we're just showered in cribs 24 hours a day. And unless you know where to look for real news, you, you wouldn't know what's happening. Uh, and so there was a, a list that was passed around and it had a list of websites. And Common Dreams was listed as one of the best of the best for getting daily news, progressive news, on things that are happening. Number two, there's a new book out called uh, The One Percent Solution. And this describes the program of uh, uh, ALEC as the American uh, Legislation Executive Council or something. So you know the American Legislative Exchange Council. American Legislative Exchange Council. But ALEC is a coordination of big businesses uh, funded by the Koch brothers and others. They produce legislation and then it's entered into the record, uh, you know, the legislature in a bunch of states. The, the billionaires funding, uh, well, the Koch brothers and others, they're funding cookie cutter legislation that's being passed in state after state. They're taking over the control of states 
uh, in putting Republican criminals in charge one state at a time. Their goal is to have total control of the country so they can repeal minimum wage laws, repeal all environmental laws. Naomi Klein talks about this in her book, No is Not Enough. And she answers, she's got the best answer to the question. We keep answering, asking ourselves, how can otherwise intelligent looking people who are Republicans keep saying that global warming is a myth? 97% of the scientists and 98% of the population of the world accepts it, but these people keep saying, no, oh, climate change goal, it's all a myth, it's all a myth, it's all a myth. Right. Because to accept that it's happening, it means the detonation of the ideological scaffolding on which contemporary conservative conservatism exists. That is to say, uh, David Michael Green wrote an article called, Let's Stop Calling Conservative Conservatism an Ideology. It's not. It's a goddamn death machine. It means death to the planet, death to millions of people, death to the environment. That's what conservatism is today. And he said we should welcome it into our family just as we would welcome the Black Plague. So, Thing, uh, that's about all I have to say, but uh, I have three copies left of this if anybody wants to buy a copy and take it with them, Naomi Klein's book. And um, next week we'll have uh, more literature and Xerox copies, uh, summaries of what we talked about tonight and, uh, you know, the climate, uh, latest in climate change. So if anybody wants any of the, the copies I have with me tonight, see me at the back table there before you go. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Mr. speeches? And then the okay. speeches. All right. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I see we had a really we had a really good turnout tonight, which is which is good. I'm glad to see the College of Complexes is alive and well. I'm sure they didn't come because I mean it's probably just the topic, you know. I mean I think people are interested in the topic and you know, if if the election was stolen, that's that's a serious issue. That, that affects all of us, you know, it affects our ability to our our country to be a democracy. Look, if we don't have honest elections, then the United States is not a democracy. It's that simple. Now, uh, I'm also glad to see that we heard from somebody tonight who got disenfranchised, Tom here, and uh, and we heard from an election judge and got to find out, you know, how the votes are counted, Karina. So, and of course, Karina simply confirmed what I was saying, which is that provisional ballots, by and large, are not counted. Now they were, again, they were counted in California, but in most places, no. Um, I gotta give I gotta give uh, Dr. Laura's not here. I gotta give Dr. Laura a lot of credit because she's she's doing a lot uh, here in Illinois to try to fight you know to to try to make sure our elections are honest. And uh, I have not read Code Book, uh, Code Red, excuse me, Code Red, and most of the other books. But I'm I'm gonna look into that. Uh, I did read um, I I did read Part of Democracy Lost, and I would say that uh, I believe that it is. The allegations in Democracy Lost, basically, the, the stuff that, what they're alleging is that, is that, is that somebody tampered with the, with the electronically safe uh, voter registration records to, to prevent people from voting in time for the Democratic primary, people who were Democrats. And that, and that this tilted the Democratic primary in many states in, uh, away from Bernie Sanders and in favor of Hillary Clinton. Now, I believe that it's possible that this actually <coughs> happened. Now, who did the hack? Was it, was, it, was it Russian hackers? Was it was it people working for the yeah, was it people working for the Democratic Party? Voting machines. I don't know. Well, voting machines don't don't voting hack them. Hey, Mike, one fool at a time. Okay. Um, I believe it's possible. Uh, it's I'm I'm a I'm a skeptic by nature, so I'm not going to say. First of all, and also you've got to understand that I. For, for most people, everything is either true or false. It either happened or it didn't. But sometimes there's an in-between area where it may have happened, but we don't know if it happened or not. So I'm not gonna, you know, I, and so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say something definitely happened when it, when it may or may have or may not have. Now, which brings me to the matter of Russian hacking, which is. That, that this is something that may have happened. I think, I believe this is possible. Yeah. It, it hasn't been proved. We got it, we got it, but there's an investigation that's going on and we'll see what happens with that. Now, now, I do, 
I, I do think, though, uh, Dr. Laura, that you seem to be assuming the worst about the Democrats while you give Republicans and, and the Russian government the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. Republicans. So, nope. so, I said 26 uh, states yeah, from the Republican. Russian. Okay. Nope. Well, you do seem to be giving mind. the benefit of the doubt to the, okay, one fool at a time, but you do seem to be giving the benefit of the doubt to the You're Russian right. government. Now, and on the subject of the Russian government, I would also just like to say with Sid, um, yeah, the United States has, has often behaved as an imperialistic country and infer interfered in the elections of other countries, and I believe that that's wrong. I believe it's wrong for one country to interfere in the elections of another country. And by that rationale, that, make, if, that makes it wrong for Russia to interfere in our elections. So, uh, now Tim, you... You said, you were, you were talking about globalization as if, oh, Tim, oh, there you are, Tim. You were talking about globalization as, as if it were inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, I'd say a majority of Americans don't feel that way, and a lot of people around the world don't either. And by globalization, I assume you mean unrestricted trade. Uh, trade, with no, trade with no boundaries, with no, with, with, with no rules, with, you know, with no ground rules, with no nothing, with, where, where basically the corporations can do anything they want. No. Yeah, I'm sure the multinational corporations would like that to happen, but it's not inevitable. And as a matter of fact, one of the things, although I, although I oppose Trump, one of the things he did that I do agree with was pulling the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, that was the biggest um, mistake we made. And I've been giving some thought on what we can do. I think that. I think that Dr. Laura's got a lot of good ideas about what we can do about this, and she's doing a lot. Uh, I would just add some other things. First of all, I believe that we should repeal HAVA, the Help America Vote Act. Um, also, we need, we need to start a movement. To, we need to get a movement going to end the felony disenfranchisement laws in, yeah. in states. You know, the people in those states need yeah. to do that. Third, we need to end. We need to end the state contracts with cross-check, and we can start right here in our own state of Illinois. And fourth, I agree with Dr. Laura that we should use paper ballots in preference to the electronic ballots. Yeah. I'm certainly glad that they're still using paper ballots in Wisconsin, uh, although even that could not prevent the kind of the kind of shenanigans that I observed when I when I was up there. And uh, and that's that's all I have to say on the subject. Close so, up, so thank you and good night. Okay. Hey.